Hello and welcome to Talking Baseball. September Saviors, who's going to get the call and make the final push to the postseason for their team? And some other stuff. Let's do it. Hello and welcome to Talking Baseball, presented to you by SeatGeek. My name is Jimmy Jakeson to my left. Trev looking great in his John Boy Media uni in the center and producer BBD behind the dish brought to you by Seat Geek coming to you from the studios. Trev, his studio. I got the Chris Archer chain. I can see that. That looks nice. A rude hat. What's that hat, Trev? You know, this is a uh, fashion company that uh, I bought this hat. It cost way too much money. And it doesn't look great on me, so I'm trying to figure out a way to wear it because, like I said, it costs a decent amount, and I've only worn it a couple times. So I'm figuring that out, guys. But I do look good in my jersey, that's for sure. The white jersey is a lot nice. better than our other co-host, Jacob Story Alley. Jake, how are you doing? Uh, it's just Jake. It's on the birth certificate, so um, let's let's try to tighten that up. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Uh, sun's out, guns out. You could tell Trev's intimidated by trying to come at me like that off the rip. I'm doing well. Our, our Yanks are back in a funkaroo. Watch out for that. Uh, Tampa, you sneaking? Uh, and excited to talk, talk ball with you guys. Midweek episode, we got some good September call-ups as the calendar's about to turn. That's exciting. Um, and a lot of, uh, you know, is it a labor pot again? I don't know. Trevor's tidbits, whew, some union stuff going on, and uh, Manfred got confronted by a bunch of Hall of Famers, and he was uh, a bit shook by it, per the reports. So we'll get into all of that. I think we're going to do some labor stuff first. Is that leading us off, Trev? Just an update for everyone? Is that what we decided? We can we can 100% start there. By now, you know, I think people have heard the news that the MLBPA is going to help minor leaguers organize and then eventually unionize. Um, it all came about from um, a group put together called the Advocates for Minor Leaguers. And these guys have been going to bat for, you know, just spreading awareness about kind of what the situation is really like in the minor leagues. Uh, it has a bunch of former ball players on it, a couple other people as well. And they've just been fighting for, um, you know, minor league rights since 2019, I believe. So effectively what happens now is uh, there'll be a bunch of voting cards sent out to the minor leaguers. And if a 30% clip comes back that they want to organize uh, and have MLBPA uh, bargain on their behalf, a formal vote then goes out and uh, a majority wins there. And then that will the minor leaguers will be absorbed into the MLBPA. So, you know, before when we used to talk about you know, labor talks and the CBA, a lot of people would be like, why, well, why don't we talk about minor league conditions in the CBA? And before this, you know, or if this does happen, it'll be the first time that the PA will be allowed to negotiate on anyone outside of in the 40-man roster. So um, it's a big step, um, you know, a couple of notes on it. The executive board, which is made up of a bunch of, you know, high-end current players, guys that have been around the block, they voted in, they were unanimous, unanimous, overwhelmingly in favor of inviting the minor leaguers into the union. And I think that doesn't surprise a lot of people because, you know, if you go through the minor leagues at all, you understand like a lot of changes needed to be done. Um, and then I guess, I guess clearing some stuff up, it won't necessarily be the PA executive board negotiating on behalf of uh, the minor leaguers. It'll be, They'll have their own like separate bargaining unit, which will effectively be the advocates for minor leaguers. So, you know, it's pretty cool. It's a step in the right direction. I was kind of talking to you guys about it saying, you know, things were already getting a little bit better in the minor leagues. You know, teams were focusing on housing. They understand the benefits of, you know, nutrition and rest and all that stuff now and making sure that these facilities are getting up to date, but it, it, it's been slow. It hasn't happened quickly enough. I think this will accelerate that entire process. 
And eventually we'll get to where I think the game should go, where like major league baseball teams treat the minor leagues like what they are, the lifeblood of your organization. So this is uh, obviously a step in the right direction. We'll keep everybody updated um, as we get like the vote numbers and all that stuff. And then I'm sure during the off season, we'll kind of dive a little bit deeper into it. But if you saw the headline and were wondering what was going on, I mean, that is what's going on with that. And like you said, it's been going on for a little bit now where I, th- I feel like, I don't know if Slade Heath got as part of this group but he's been, and I know him just from Yankee ties and all that, he's been an advocate for the minor leagues forever. I think I follow him on Instagram or Twitter, so I see it a lot. And I remember in 2018, 19, it started getting really loud, and these groups started really getting loud. And so far, we had the con- con- condensement of the minor leagues, where now like each organization only has four or five teams. I know the Yankees had eight. It's much easier to make sure you're taking care of the guys if you don't have a bunch that are there just to be paid little and be a practice squad. And then we've had housing now. We had a bunch of other stuff. So this is the one more step. And while it maybe like seems slow in the grand scheme of things, if, if we go from where we were in 2017 to where it looks like we're going to be in 2023 or 2024, like that's kind of a in the history of baseball, very quick tidying up. It's maybe as fast as it can, can happen without, you know, getting going into pitfalls and messing up along the way. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool. I think whatever players, I know you wanted to shout them out, but the same way when guys sign free as free agents and they thank Kurt flood, cause like the history of the game, like making sure like, man, so many minor leaguers in, in, in two decades from now are going to hopefully understand how long of a battle it was and how bad it, and how bad it was. These guys are fighting for it. It was pretty cool. Because hopefully 20 years from now, sure, so, a, this is the, the time period where it's like, that's when it changed. That's what we're in right now. Yeah, so there was you know three former players that started this. It was actually started in 2020. I think I said 2019. It started in 2020, uh, Raul Jacobson, Ty Kelly, and Matt Perret. Uh, those guys started it. They brought in uh, Billy Fletcher Jr., uh, who's like a labor leader. And then uh, along the way, they've added a few other baseball players and put them on their board and stuff like that. But I agree with you. I mean, this is... Something that was always talked about, um, but, you know, talk is cheap, man. You got to do something. And they've been um, at this. And I guess you're right, James. Like, you know, in two years, they've been, <laughs> this particular group has been absorbed into the MLBPA or is on, in the process of that happening. Um, it's pretty cool. And I agree. Like, I hope the stories of how bad the minor leagues conditions uh, carry on so guys do feel thankful as we get better and, you know, you start living the cush life down in the the bushes, as we used to call them. Yeah, I guess I guess that's where. Whenever we talked about this, I, I was always a little surprised. We we talk about the kind of the, how the Rays originally were the team that treated baseball differently. I, I was always shocked that there wasn't a team and an owner that viewed their minor leagues as as their investment because it truly is. And and I realize that it ends up being the top one percent of a team's minor leaguers that really end up being the impact players. So, so maybe the investment wise on their end doesn't seem worth it, but, but taking care of these guys uh, and making them part of your organization and keep making sure they sleep. Well, I mean, we hear the stories about minor leaguers that are sleeping in houses and guys sleeping in closets and things like that, that uh, it just seems, it seems ridiculous. And Trev, I I know you, you made sure uh, as someone who was a first round pick and you, you had the bonus to take care of guys along the way. I think you still have in New Britain, Connecticut, I think you're still paying for a a TV service there because you wanted it under your name to make sure you took care of the boys that, um, yeah, I I guess I'm surprised that it's taken this long to get here. I'm, I'm glad that group has helped getting, got us here and we've heard the things about housing. I guess that my biggest question is kind of coming from the MLB side, and I, I guess this would be an opinion from you. Is it, do you think MLB was like kind of blindsided by this? Do do you think they just knew it was going to happen, and that it was it was in the cards, and they were going to have to deal with this at some point, and they were just waiting for it, or do you think they were kind of taken by surprise a little bit? Uh, MLB, like as far as like like. Major League Baseball, surprised at what? The minor league was trying to unionize? 
kind of like with, with this news was, you know, this all this minor league stuff makes sense to me. Like, you know, this this should be happening. We've talked about it on here a few times, and we've seen it evolving. We've seen teams offer housing and things like that. I, I guess were they surprised by the announcement of the – you know, the minor leaguers coming under the union and, you know, are, were they in shock or have, do you think major league baseball has been expecting this to happen for a little while now? I'm sure they have been expecting it. I mean, there was a lawsuit that they had to pay out that was filed originally in 2014. They had to pay $185 million as a class action lawsuit filed by a bunch of minor leagues. I believe that of like Penn or something like that. And that was when they were seeking pay for like spring training, um, and the instructional league and stuff like that. So they have that, they have a bunch of these groups coming up, especially when they see a group like advocates for minor leaguers kind of, you know, getting some traction online and getting a lot of eyeballs on it. Then knowing what they're trying to do in their mission, I feel like I will be smart enough to know that something like this is coming. And you know what, dude, they should encourage it to be honest with you. It's going to make everything better for their product. Like that's what I don't understand. That's what I never understood about the minor leagues is like, it's your product, dude. Like if you want to like, say you like raise beef. Okay, Jake, like, you mm. know about beef. You eat a lot of beef. I am. You raise cattle. Don't you want to feed them the best? Yeah. Like, don't you want to treat them the best? Or do you want to just put them, you know, I don't know, dude. Well, my, my one question would be is uh, how profitable are minor league team so if i was to try and get into the the meeting of the people that may be opposed to this or this may change things for them it would be minor league team owners the the ones that aren't owned by the the mlb owners as well because a lot of changes now and i'm i don't know the profitability of minor league teams uh, how long is a minor league season 150 games so you get 70 something games to make your money I know there's some that are really, probably really, really profitable that sell out a lot, but there's got to be others, like double A teams that don't. I, Trev, you you played minor league ball. You went stadium to stadium. Like, are they all? Like, there's a lot of affiliate leagues that don't make money. I know this is the minor league, so there is a connection, but it's kind of the same thing. Like, how yeah. much how much more pressure is just put on minor league teams to be like, fuck, we got to be profitable because. Pay is going to raise, well, housing's raising, all that. Yeah, but it's they don't pay the salaries. The teams pay the salaries. So th- that the you know a pay increase wouldn't affect them at all. Most guess, of the, yeah. the equipment and all, most of the equipment and all the stuff that they'll bring in. And I'm assuming that's kind of what they're going to be talking about. Is you know each facility needs to have this, and there's going to be a list of things that each facility has to have. That's all usually going to come from the team. That's like the teams cool. are going to have to be paying this to own a minor league team, and you don't really have to pay for the product. You're just you're running a business. You're operating a business of sorts where customers come in and out, and you kind of yeah. operate the stadium more or less. But the players are like the biggest. Essentially, product. yes. Yeah. You're you're if you're a minor league owner, you're still involved with the players. You know, you do promotions and and whatever. You're still very much involved. I mean, I have had great relationships with some of the people uh, that have owned the minor league teams that I played with. Um, but you know, the pay increases and stuff, I think that's going to be great for, you know, all of these teams, the minor league teams, you're going to just get happier players, players that are going to be like, I don't know, they're just going to be, it's just going to be a better atmosphere in my opinion. And players are going to be like, be more willing to go above and beyond to promote your team because they're getting fairly compensated for it. Yeah. I guess I don't know what's going on in the other rooms. And I tried to get in there. I was, I was wrong. I didn't have the right mindset, <laughs> but I'm interested. This is, they oppose this is great this for some though. Reason. Yeah. This is great, though. I just, again, I'll never understand why it took this long, you know, but we could talk about 2009, what we were eating in spring training as big leaguers and, you know, all of that. Like, it was just, there weren't good enough standards, essentially. And then that just has changed. Since 2010, when we, twins, we got a couple big free agents. We got, like, Carl Pavano. We get Jim Tome, And then it's like, oh, shit, we got to, like, step it up a little bit our food changed then nutrition came in and then like bam 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 bam. and all this stuff now when you look back it's like no shit dude like nutrition matters rest matters like keeping your players happy and you know healthy it, like matters um but it wasn't it wasn't the case that long ago dude a while ago back in 2009 
I didn't even take care of myself, Trev. I was wearing terrible shirts. Mm. And now I wear Miz and Maine, and they're really comfortable. Yeah. They're, I'm out on cotton in the summer. I'm hoping fall comes. I can be back in on cotton. For now, Miz and Maine's my go-to. Machine washable, super dry, moisture wicking, sweat. I don't. My shirt doesn't get wet, even if I'm hot. You'll receive $35 off any regular pri- price order of $125 more when you use code BASEBALL. $35 off when you go to M-I-Z-Z-E-N-A-N-D-M-A-I-N.com and use our promo code BASEBALL. They got a ton of new polos, dress shirts, pullovers on their site right now. Get ready for fall. That's what I would do. But they got like the Q-zips are really nice for fall Trevor. Weather. Trevor has a question, and I there are some rumors around the office about Mizzen and Maine Mondays, but Trevor Plouffe, yes. James, it looks stretchy, those shirts. Are they stretchy? Yeah, yeah. I don't wear anything that's not stretchy anymore. Like, Same. I don't care what it is. Formal wear, got to be stretchy. You never know when you got to bust out like an athletic maneuver, and if you're in something stiff, it just hinders your ability to do that, and we don't like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, some of the baseball teams might stretch their lineup Ooh. or their roster and bring up some skies. Jake, you are going to tell us the best call-ups that might happen. There's some some studs. Do you think, before you tell us, yes. geez, do you think any of them, like, is there, You don't not a specific person, do you think right. we're going to get one from here out, like another Michael Harris or Pena, like a rookie that makes a difference, even if it's in the bullpen, kind of like, Waka did and and David Price did like they were kind of like September call-ups that then were part of the postseason a thousand percent and, okay. and there's two different buckets here and, and we're gonna you know like we've been doing with our talking base, baseball recap apps we're, we're gonna focus on the contenders because there's some cool guys that are gonna get called up and and there are a couple super prospects I want to mention but yes and like also go back to the Rays and, and there's a there's a good article at MLB.com that kind of sparked us on this and and they got Basically, they got feedback from all the all the beat reporters about who could be your team's impact September call ups. But like, think about the Rays. Uh, and in this article, it's funny the Rays say Wander Franco, which yeah, yeah. If that guy gets called up, I could see him being pretty impactful. But also, do you guys remember Shane McClanahan? I, I mean, they called him up <laughs> to start in the postseason before he had gotten action. So now the Rays are always the extreme example. But we are going to see some guys, and, and I think I wanted to start out uh, east. We'll go east to west, maybe. Um, but there's two teams that I think they're definitely going to call up impactful guys. And I think the number one, and it's a team that's been looking for a spark a little bit, is the Toronto Blue Jays, uh, a team that has kind of been 500 since the first month of the season, more or less. Um, and I think they're going to call up uh, or this article says, and I, I agree with it, I think they're going to call up Gabriel Moreno again. Because, uh, A, originally when September call-ups happened, you called up a third catcher. Because it was just like it's the most grueling position. It allows you the most flexibility. It's the end of the year. But the Jays are a special example themselves because Alejandro Kirk has been one of the breakout players of this season. And the Jays do like to DH him. So on the days you DH him, you have another option behind the dish, and it helps out that that option is the number 18th-ranked prospect. And when Moreno came up earlier this year, he it was a little overmatched. Um, not even. I, I mean, he was a 276 hitter. Uh, there was just no pop. It was all singles. And since he went back down to the minor leagues, uh, he's been hitting again. And, and Trev and I talked about this a little bit on Monday. I I think I've got a new flirtation in baseball. It's guys who get called up get sent down for a little bit and then get back, get called up again because they've kind of got, they got the taste in their mouth and they want it again. So I think him and then Chadwick Tromp for the Braves. Our uh, guy. Yes. I mean, all-time baseball name. Um, Not as high of a prospect as Gabriel Moreno, but it allows them with William Contreras, who you could put in a similar boat to Alejandro Kirk, and even Travis Darno. When that guy's right at the plate, that guy's a beast. He's right right now. I know. I think he's crushing August. I think he's got like a 360 batting average in August. It just allows you to be so much more flexible with using them as pinch hitters or putting them as the DH on a given day that I, I think those are two guys that I think 
those are going to significantly impact the day-in, day-out lineups of two, you know, potential playoff impact teams in Atlanta and Toronto. I think, are the Braves using both catchers? Does Contreras DH when Darno starts? I think I think they try to get those guys in the lineup when they can. Yeah, Contreras DH is all the time. Yeah. I know he was the starting DH in the All-Star game due to replacements for injuries. Yeah. But, but so do they not have a third? Are they... <sighs> Uh, I think at different points this year, like Chadwick Trump has been up earlier yeah. this year, but yeah. It's a risky thing to do, to have right. both catchers in the starting nine, because then you can't lose your DH. But they, it, I'm looking at it now, it looks like they do that a lot, which is, and it's their like four or five hitters. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that can definitely for them, uh, it's it just allows you so much flexibility. And like you're saying, you know, sometimes we see teams do that if you need to, swap in the DH and you lose the DH, that means your pitcher has to hit. But teams still do that uh, towards the end of the game if they don't think the pitcher is going to bat again. But, yeah, it, it, it allows another layer for them. And, uh, you know, the Jays, I know Kirky defensively doesn't necessarily uh, doesn't necessarily turn the needle as much as his hitting does. So, yeah, I mean, those are significant changes going through a month of the baseball season. Yeah, but the Jays use their DH, so I don't know how... I think it would still be like a backup situa- situation or something because doesn't Springer get a lot of DH starts? They like to rotate guys through there, um, but, I mean, Kirky's got 40 games at DH this year. That's a good amount. I, I like this time of the year um, because... There's a couple sides of it, you know. There's the side that you're kind of talking about now. Teams that are in races that, like, you know, maybe need a jolt or an extra bat off the bench. Um, you know, we'll talk about a few more of those guys in a bit. But there's also the other side where it's like, hey, let's see what we got. You know, like we're talking about with the Diamondbacks, they just recently called up their number one prospect, Corbin Carroll, and he kind of had like a an electric debut. Yeah, and he's going to get some playing time. Like these other guys might come up there. They might pinch hit from time to time because these rosters on these contending teams are pretty much set. But Corbin Carroll's he's just going to go out there and play ball. And you're going to get to see a little bit of glimpse into the future. The Diamondbacks have been playing really well lately. Then you add Corbin and dude, it's like talk about teams playing spoiler when you're the D backs. Yeah. You're playing spoiler, but it's more like we're playing to see if we can compete with these teams, with these young guys. Like you're, if you're a young guy, if you're Corbin Carroll, this is the time it's like, fuck it. I belong in the big leagues. I don't care about playing spoiler. I par- care about showing you in the rest of the big leagues that like I'm here to stay. So you're going to get a few of those different guys other than get the leeway. Um, but on the, on what you're talking about, like, you know, Derek Hall coming up for the Phillies and, and him being just the bat off the bench. That's, it's also very exciting. You have some just your roster just gets that much longer, that much deeper. And um, every year, man, somebody comes up and, and makes a difference during the race. And and I think that's the next bucket. Uh, you mentioned my guy, Corbin Carroll. As we, you know, we are the voices of baseball. Some people say hmm. in the comments, um, the super prospects, what's next? You mentioned my guy, Corbin Carroll on my snakes. The dude looks like a freak show. Uh, when you just look at him, he's not the most intimidating cat. He's listed at 5'10", uh, but the dude flies, and I think he's a five-tool guy. Uh, like you mentioned, he came up for his debut. It was part of the D-backs uh, down seven-run rally. They t- put up two six spots in back-to-back innings to come back against the Phils, and Corbin Carroll was in the middle of that. And you're right, Trev. I know I teased it at the end of last episode, but the Snakes, they kind of have something brewing and it's definitely like if Corbin Carroll is special, special, which he has a chance to be, and you get that taste in your mouth for September, there's going to be some interesting snakes conversations this offseason, which I love. The other guy who deserves a shout, and again, I told you the kitty gloves are off on this team, the Baltimore Orioles. They've made themselves a part of this conversation all year. And Gunnar Henderson, left side of the infield guy, uh, currently listed as the number two prospect in baseball. The front office said he's on their radar screen for joining the club. 
And man, well it, then do it. Right? If you're Yeah, let's go. It, it, Why would you say that? It it's it, not do it. I mean, <laughs> he's been lighting up AAA. He's got 11 home runs in his 64 AAA games. He's got a 502 slugging in AAA. Batting average is 282. On base is 386. And who's he going to replace? Mateo or Urias? Not Mateo. Mateo's been pretty good for that. I think Gunner's better at third base. I think he grades out like way better at third. But it's one of those two. He's going to be on the left side, right? Yeah. Um, and, and that's where, you know, if you're Baltimore, maybe that's the, the conversation that we're not appreciating enough is Jorge Mateo has Mateo been, hasn't really been good for them. Uh, he's not an OPS guy, but he's electric. Like he's, he's Trevor, sure. he's a, he's a Manny Margot. His defense is elite at shortstop and he steals. Yeah. He's got, he's, he's, got a, he's got a three war this year, basically just from, you know, being able to run and play defense. And, uh, and you wonder if that's the tricky part of this. Cause he's, you know, well, Gunner's rated out very well defensively. So, I mean, he'll, you got a 277 on base percentage with Mateo. I, think, I understand that. They, but I think part of the conversation would be you shouldn't be blocking him. Urias has been playing really good for them recently. Um, uh, could he play a little second base and maybe you put Henderson at third and Rugi's out? But I, I guess the only conversation with the Orioles before bringing this guy up is that they have been so fun and so good. Um, if you end up knocking a, a Mateo or someone like that out of the lineup and then things go the wrong way, it, it changes your whole vibe. But uh, for how talented this kid is, and if you're an Orioles fan, and the opposite, opposite side of it, if he can give you a little more of a push, and now this Orioles team that I was brutal on, uh, to start this year, I was looking at some of these guys out there, and I, I wondered if the Orioles were going to win 60 games this year. If now I can look and I see Cedric Mullins, Rushman, um, you know, their pitchers have been doing really well lately, and if you can call up Gunnar Henderson... If you can get an October push for this year, and those same Blue Jays I just talked about, Orioles are a game and a half back. If you can sneak up on them, or if you can just get real excitement for next year, um, you'd love to see it. it. It would be great for the sport. It would be great for the city of Baltimore. Yeah, I'm not fully entrenched in, in uh, I'll, I'll lean on Baltimore, or Baltimore crew in the chat. Maybe I'll ask Kev in the office. Sure. Uh, offensive numbers wise, and and Gunnar Henderson's supposed to be very very good. I think they had him as a seventy third base defense and fifty shortstop. So high level. Uh, I mean, and if he can produce, I I don't know. There could be the Odor factor where Urias and Mateo like mean a lot to the club, but they're they're not both having not great offensive seasons. I think you can kick Urias to second base and Odor to the bench. Sure, even then, yeah. Right, and you give yourself the option, right? Um, which that would be fun to see. And, man, I mean, we're talking top three prospects in baseball. These aren't, you know, even some of these guys who, who also, you know, we're not going to fully shout out this episode, but Tristan Casas might get the call for Boston, and he, he's got a chance to be really good. You know, even Peraza for the Yanks, like it doesn't look like it's happening. You know, those guys in that... 30 to 40 range, they got a chance to be really good, but you also never know. When you're in those top five, especially in recent years now that scouting and, and everything's gotten to a next level, you've got a really good chance to be a special ball player that uh, would would love to see it um, for Baltimore. And, and then the final bucket, you know, I shout out a couple more of those guys and maybe sound off in the comments if, if you've got a guy we're missing. Um, you know, I know <laughs> I, I saw the Rockies have a shortstop on this list that might get the call. Not fully in my book yet. I hope he is. I hope he's the next guy, Ezekiel Tovar. But two guys who we could see currently on playoff teams who could have impacts this postseason. Whenever there's a pitcher out of Houston, I get scared. I, I say that as a Yankee fan in the rest of baseball because, man, that place is a factory. And they've got a kid named Hunter Brown who's got a 2.55 ERA at AAA this year um, in over 100 innings pitched. He touches 99 on the gun. Houston's got six starting pitchers. It's part of what makes them d completely different well, as a franchise. Verlander just went on the IL. Does that mean? Well, now they're down to five. Um, but if well, that he could he be coming up, or he could be coming up, or he can be your two inning weapon out of the bullpen. Because if he's throwing 99 as a starter, you like to think he's got that in the pin. And then the other guy uh, who who stood out on the list, Cody Morris for the Guardians. We always wonder where the Guardians get these young guys from. 
Uh, Cody Morris, he's got a 1.62 ERA in AAA this year uh, with 93 strikeouts and 61 innings between AA and AAA. Um, I mean, the Guardians, they're currently leading the Central. He seems like a kid that could get a shot this year. And, you know, when you a guy like that can change your whole bullpen formula, and I love it. Trev. They called it B-Lack. Hunter Brown, Hunter Brown, as an hour ago, was going to get the call to join Houston. Look at that. Look at that. On it. Ooh. That's cool. Uh, but, uh, but we, I don't know if you guys did this on the, the recap episode, but talking about the Orioles a little bit, and then you talking about players that go to the show, go back down, and then come back. Kyle Bradish. Yeah. Since his return from being sent down, I think they Got sent him. stand up. I think they sent him a double A. Since his return has been nuts. So it is cool when they go down, fix something, come back up, and like, I'm fucking staying this yeah. time. No thanks. Yeah. No more of that minor league crap that they have to make yeah. new unions about. The Wolf of to Wall feed Street. us all right. <laughs> yeah, the, I, I'm going to be in the show. It, thanks. The Wolf of Wall Street Award. Like, you you know what's funny it. is they people would talk like, or I've heard organizations talk like, you know, it's good the minor leagues are like that. It makes it makes you more hungry to get to the big leagues. We don't want people just cozy in double A. And it's like shut the fuck <laughs> up, dude. Get that. Like if you've ever said that. If that if those words have ever come out of your mouth or you thought it, then be the first person to tell you, shut the fuck up. <laughs> and and by the way, go go check out the article because you know there's a there's other prospects. Ken Waldachuk, who was a big part of the Frankie Montas trade, he just got called up. Um, he's gonna make a start on Thursday. He's in this article, and there's a bunch of veterans on here, which kind of made us laugh because it's away from the concept a little bit. But I know, like Matthew Boyd, a talking baseball favorite, he's been rehabbing all years. The the, the Mariners might give him some innings. <laughs> Forgot um, they got him. Yeah, so there's there's a couple vets that are gonna sneak into this September too, and they can be <laughs> even more impactful than a rookie. You ever heard of J Flair for the Cardinals? Yep. 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 If I do this to you guys right now, <laughs> Hammercock. Just. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Allergies. Let's ask him. Let's ask him. Yeah. Speaking um, of Roman, you get ten dollars <laughs> off your Roman swipes, Trev. Speaking of J Flair's Hammercock. R- I was going to give you guys a thick neck so we can transition to Roman oh. from that. If I said thick neck, you'd say. Well, he said hammer cock. Chase so he kind of beat you to yeah. it. But right. but Big young necks, young hammer cocks. Josh Young? Josh Young? Josh and Jace, the bros. But. It'd be assuming something, but I feel like it'd be an educate an educated assumption. About Josh and Jace. Clarity or Josh? Yeah. Oh yeah. Josh is. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to have sex like them. You can use the Roman swipes. They're clinically proven to help you last longer in bed. No prescriptions needed. You get PE treatments. They're safe, effective, used by millions of men. Free two-day shipping with the code TALKIN. Also $10 off your first order if you're approved. Don't sweat it. Mm. Just swipe it. Oh! That's good. That's a good slogan, Roman. Use that. Don't sweat it. Just swipe it. Penis, we're talking about. You last longer in bed that way. And then there's more, you know, shared pleasure, enjoyment, fertility rate goes higher, everything like that. So go to getroman.com slash talkin, T A L K I N, today. And if you're approved, you'll get $10 off your first order. Again, no prescription needed, clinically proven to help you last longer in bed. The last topic that we have is just a really funny headline. Rod Carew, Hall of Famer, top 10 MVP vote getter in like 20 seasons, probably 12 if I had to like guess. I don't know. I know he won it once. He was rookie of the year. Batting title maybe five times. Mm. Called one of the best hitters to ever play. Interacts with me on Twitter a good amount, which I like. He. 81 career war. He. Real. And some other. Hall of Famers had their Cooperstown brunch with Manfred where they talk about the state of the game. And uh, apparently they let Manfred have it. And Carew led the attack. And Manfred was shook. He didn't like it. And then Rod Carew 
shared it with the public. And like Manfred has a line like, what stays in Cooperstown brunch? Said Cooperstown brunch. Like, what? Yeah, man. What? Yep. Um, so the same complaints, uh, Rose, Rosenthal wrote the article about it. And it was like the same complaints we have, but because they're Hall of Famers and older men, they are just like lumping into like old men screams at clouds. But like Manfred, like, I don't know if that's what you're doing. Like if you're just like, yeah, they're just old and they're out of touch. Like, no, they're complaining about the same thing. Like a lot of people are complaining about to Manfred's credit, the shifts, they, they are implementing like that. They're testing it out. They want to try it. They want to change it. I do think they, they hoped the game would correct itself and it didn't uh, for 20 years. It went on like a bit too long. And then pace of play, the three batter minimum rule, the the runner on second base, a little bit of you are ruining our great game vibe. And I think I agree with the main four points. The three batter minimum rule has not done what you thought it would do. It's not more intriguing. There's a better way to do what you were trying to do, I think, if you just limit reliever usage or tighten up rosters. Like Brandon McCarthy has a bunch of different ways and ideas for that. But what we're seeing is more position players pitch because of stuff like that. And and then the ghost runner, I, I think there's a better way to do that too. So, Although I have become numb to the ghost runner, which is... I hate the ghost runner. I hate it because all of a sudden you're playing a different game. Uh, a lot of the time when Manfred talks about that specific uh, new rule, he says it works. He says you know, people it like the game. it. I don't think people like it. I think <laughs> it, it might work, but that doesn't mean it's best for the game. Do you, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. We've done all the stats. Majority, it was like, what, 80% of extra inning games ended before the 11th anyway? So you're, you're not fixing that much. Yes. Yeah, and like you said, I think Manfred, and, and I don't want to give just Manfred credit for, you know, deciding to, you know, do stuff with shifts or the pitch clock. Like, he has a collection of people, former players that are now with MLB, you know, figuring these things out. Okay, like it's not just uh, Manfred in like his lab coming up with different ideas. That's just like not the case. What we have to keep remembering, I think Rod has to remember this too. I'm sure he knows is that Manfred is just, he's the punching bag for the owners and for like that side of baseball. He's admitted that like he's not, I said this on baseball today with T-Rose. We have this notion that the commissioner of baseball is guarding the game and making sure it's going in the right direction at all times. That's just not the case, dude. But That's I, not his number one job. But I do think there have been commissioners that have, and I don't know. Well, I don't he's know the level. stated explicitly like what he needs to do, and that's shield the owners from yes, yes, essentially the press. He, he is, but I think there's other sports where owners have kind of taken charge and, and went to the owners and said, these are my ideas. This is what I want to do. Do I have your approval? And then went and did them. And I don't think he's that kind of commissioner. Though. I or, or commissioner. Yeah, I agree. But I'm just saying, so that that's a bucket in like, this is not good. Like we, we want someone who will do some stuff. Um, you know, Bud Selig for all his faults, he brought in league play and we'll look back on some stuff. I, like, you know, their balanced schedule next year. That's better. You get credit for things that happen under your, Rain, to use, like, the historic word for it. And there are some things. But but it is hilarious that he thinks he's just going to, like, the, the oh. Cooperstown talk to Hall of Famers, and they're just, like, ready for him. I was going to say, I mean, A, Trev, I'm going to fluff you a little bit. I do this about once a month. You know, we're through the dog days. Rod Carew, pretty cool baseball reference page, 328 batting average for the career. 92 home runs, Trev. Eat that, Rod Carew. That's pretty cool, big dog. Um, so love that for you. And, yeah, I uh, I was kind of shocked that you guys were turning it on Uncle Rob here because could you imagine you think you're going to a friendly brunch and the door closes behind you and Johnny Bench and Jeff Bagwell lock the door 
and they say, why don't you sit down, Bob? Because we got some stuff to talk about. I mean, just blindsided. Um, no, man. I, I hey, hey, look, for real, you're making a good point, Jake. There's like, that's his nightmare situation. <laughs> I don't nightmare. think he's ever liked having that brunch. He's got to go sit down with a bunch of dudes who like got a lot of time on their hands to think about stuff. They've yeah. seen a lot change in the game. Things that they used to value deeply are not valued anymore. A lot of the stats that they would that they were trying to, you know, get to aren't valued anymore. They're they're saying all the things that you thought were right or wrong. So like I understand that these guys can be angry about some things going on with the game, but Rob Manford has to know that that is just not, he probably needs to like stop having that brunch. I think he's done. He's probably going to send someone else now. Yeah. Yeah. For like his, for his sake. Yeah. There's certain things that are like, you know, there's been this whole campaign against uh, four RBIs now. And it's like, guys, come on. Like this isn't really a head to head battle. Like RBIs are, I don't want to do it, but and you had Pujols and Alonzo and all those talk about, and it's like, yeah, obviously RBIs are good as a team stat, but again, it's an individual stat. There's a lot of shit that goes on for that. But you want to drive runners in. But I just think it's funny that they got attacked. And then I, I do agree with half of it. Me and Rod Crew on the same team. He, he's, he is like vice president of the keep paper out of baseball campaign that I started. He solidified that. He responded and said, I agree. Keep paper out of baseball. So we're kind of like, you know, running mates. Well, well we, we talk about baseball all the time. We talk about the state of the game. We care about the state of the game. We're very invested in what the state of the game is and what will it be and what it will be. You know, so like all of these ideas, we've been talking about them. It's like good. For, it's for great. I think, I think we're going to be in it. We got young studs. We got stadiums that are selling out. We got people tuning in. We had a high rate. Um, uh, games this year and we there's no pitcher hitting in the nl anymore right. that's better we're gonna have a balanced schedule next year we have a better while maybe a better playoff system i'm not positive we'll see uh i'm interested to find out about the new playoff system and 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 they're gonna try and change the shifts next year which the shifts have to what we know have been like gabe who works for us his whole life that's the baseball he knows yeah. They let it go so long that we have young kids now that are like doing the old man argument of like, don't change the game. I know because <laughs> they know <laughs> they know shifts like they know when Giambi and Teixeira came over and then their batting average died in their home run sword because they couldn't beat the shift and McCann and Teixeira and and uh, I'm ready to go back to ball and play and running. So I, I think. I, I get me to next year in a way if we implement this stuff and the pitch clock when those things are instituted and people don't hate them vehemently because they're new maybe five years from now I, I think I think that version of the game I think we're like on path so at credit to whoever's making the decision I think they are trying the right things and hoping to implement the right things they got it wrong for the the last the last like 2011 to 2017 they were just wrong with a lot of the stuff they're trying to do. Our good friend Raul Ibanez is helping out mm. on the MLB side. He's, you know, Raul was awesome. One of the nicest VP guys met. of what on field game play or whatever it is. And I really like Raul. I think that's a really good role for him to have. And I trust him. I trust him in that role. Cause I, you know, you know why I trust him? Because I know he talks to dudes and he's getting the pulse and feeling it out. It wouldn't surprise me if he's, Listen to some of our stuff. He's very in tune like that. Um, so if, basically, we're running the big leagues. If you get a second today, uh, baseballhall.org, and you can click around and look at all the guys in the Hall of Fame, which is just cool anyways. Something that's really funny, and I'd love to know the decision-making here. Uh, you know, all the old guys are pictures in black and white, and that makes sense because their pictures were in black and white. A lot of the modern guys, you know, Jim Palmer's picture is in color. David Ortiz, Tony Oliva. Some of the new guys are also black and white. Uh, Mike mm. Piazza, Trevor Hoffman, their pictures are in black and white, which just seems like, I don't know. Like who, they're dead? Who made that choice? Where? What website are you talking about? Baseballhall.org. And if you just click on, like, 
the Hall of Famers. It just has 15 pages of Hall of Famers. And yeah, the, the black and white pictures seem kind of random for the new age guys. Yeah. Can you imagine a young Mike Piazza and a young Jake Story Alley just kicking around? Dyed tips. Maybe, Maybe you something. went to Italy together, back to the, the motherland. I'd love to. I'd love to. He would love to. I have an assignment for everyone. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, I, I bet you won't do it. It's brought to you by DraftKings. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code JOHNBOY to get $200 in free bets instantly when you place a $5 bet on any football game. That's code JOHNBOY only at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details to get $200 in free bets instantly by betting just $5 in any football game. On uh, morning today, we were looking at all the Malcolms that have played baseball. Not that many. And we found the Malcolm with the most career war is Mal Hill, I think his name was. I know Malcolm Smith. He knows Malcolm Smith. What's his career war? Uh, no, I think, you know, just a maybe one. From 2017 to 2021? Yeah. Oh, he didn't, he played in Bakersfield. He didn't make the bigs. But there's a Malcolm, there's one Malcolm in the minors right now. Mm. So we wanted to reach out to him and be like, dude, if you make the bigs, all you got to do is get over 0.2 war and you're the best Malcolm in the history of baseball. Ever. So if you're someone who loves baseball reference, and just stuck at a job where you're in front of a computer, go find me more and let's go find all the minor leaguers that can be the best of their name and, like, just easy wins. Like, this guy, he's a double-A reliever for the Braves. He comes up, has, like, 10-game stretch where he gets some outs. He's the best Malcolm per war in the history of baseball. I'd bet on it. So, find some others. You got the passing button Uh, over there, BBD? Passing. The Arizona Diamondbacks have exercised their 2023 club option on Tori Lavello. Oh, nice. Let's go, baby. We play for rings in the desert. Valley boy, 818 Tori Lavello. I like it, man. Hey, I want to apologize to Malik Smith, not Malcolm Smith. (laughs) That's my bad, bro. You know, that is my bad. Malik Smith, he's pretty speedy. He probably got some. I mean, he's got to be the number, number one. one Malik. Oh yeah, for sure. He's got to be five point three career WAR. His pronunciation key is the best I've ever seen. Like Alex with an M. Oh. Like Alex with an M. Perfect. Only Malik's in baseball. So like, yes, awesome. But you know, there was like ten Malcolms. They just all suck. <laughs> there was also. Jim, I think people may have spotted it before if you're on the YouTube. Uh, when you were mentioning Rod Carew, my face locked up. Because um, great baseball reference. Hall of Famer, MVP, 328 lifetime, a lot of bold. In that area where they list their agents, his says Jerry Simon question mark. <laughs> we think it's Jerry Simon, but don't hold us to it. Hey, man. I mean, I've sat with Rod Carew and Tony Oliva and had them tell me stories about when they first come up for when they first came up together and, you know this was uh in the you know 60s late 60s early 70s and he's like imagine us you know rolling down downtown in the Cadillac drop top mm. me and Tony Oliva mm. kind of st- he goes we kind of stuck out down there didn't we and they would start laughing about it man it's those guys, there's just so much baseball knowledge. I think they roomed together for like almost their entire career, like even in the big leagues, which is just needs to be a TV show. I love it. I found an article about Rod Carew, 1986. He didn't play in 86, but this says that in May, there was a team that offered him a contract to come back. He was 40 years old, and he had already said he's not playing anymore. Uh, And then in St. Paul, Minnesota, Carew's attorney, Jerry Simon, confirmed that he had received an offer. So maybe that's your welcome baseball reference. It's his attorney, 
Maybe that's the question mark. Don't know. All right. Thank you guys very much for hanging out with us for a little bit today. Congrats to all the September call-ups that are coming. Good job. Goodbye, August. Yeah, you're out. out. You're out. I hate you. Triples than homers. You don't need them. If you wanted to swing for homers, you could have had them.